morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. You're muted. Well, good morning. Let's try that again. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 449 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cry of Medium Network. Yeah. Boom, boom. Put some chest on that. <clears throat> there you go. As uh, Ariana Grande would say, sing that shit with your chest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ever heard the song Yes, Nick? Yes, and? Uh, yeah? Maybe. Uh, oh. I don't know. Okay. If you look at the video, it'll, it, reminds you of the, it reminds me a little bit of Paul Abdul's Cold Hearted. Cold Hearted Snake. Yeah. The whole dance studio and people are coming to watch them and they do this whole number for them. But uh, it has a cool little twist on it, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good song, too. It's a big hit. Um, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver. Pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver. Right? It's going to be a nice day here at the Beaver Lodge. A big thank you goes to our podcast the founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today? Um, I'll tell you what. I drove 12 hours yesterday to get home. <laughs> Ooh. So I, I, I will say it's probably okay. I'm not fully awake. I was so tired last night. I don't think I could have spelled my name correctly if you asked me to. It, it, it's it, I've driven longer than that, but I haven't done a, a road trip of that distance in years. So it's uh, it takes a lot out of you. You know, it takes a lot out of you. It was a good, it was a good, it was a good trip though. The roads, the the other than the Plaster Rock Highway, and those of you. Who know? No. Oof, boy, does that thing got to get repaved. <laughs> wow. Uh, but other than that, it was a good trip. Um, once you get through to Grand Falls, the road just improves and it's a great road the rest of the way home. And once you hit River Loo, it's almost a straight shot because you know, you're driving right along the St. Lawrence River. Uh, although it was quite uh, smoky and hazy. Uh, there was definitely wildfires happening somewhere because as we we're driving along the Gaspé Peninsula there at River Lou, it's like you, you could barely see across the river. It was so, I'll say, smoky and hazy at the same time. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was uh, it was quite something. Yeah, but everybody's happy. Everybody's home safe and all. That oh yeah, stuff. yeah. My parents were really happy. I mean, they they had a they had a wonderful trip despite some some hiccups, which extended their trip. They were gone for a month, which is oh. the longest. Yeah, a uh, little more than a month. Well, five weeks actually. So, but yeah, they're they're um they were really happy to get home. I mean, there's there's no place like home. And let's face it, you could have the most comfortable bed in the world, but when it's not your bed, it's it's you know. Mm-hmm. It's just not the same. And yep. there's not a person alive who has ever traveled who would say con- anything contrary to that statement. There yep. is no place like home. And you're no only- matter how much you like your trip, no matter how much fun exactly. you had when you get home, there's a ah. And, and there, it's not detracting from anything. It's just a simple no, no. matter of when you're home, you're just, everything's just more relaxed. And yeah. So, oh, Swanky Frankie, you drove from Thunder Bay to London. Yeah, that, that that's a long drive. 
that is mm. a ferry line. And, and what is it from Wawa to Terrace? There's a stretch of, I can't remember how many kilometers, but it's like, if you don't gas up before one, <laughs> you're going to run out because there's nothing in between. There's a mm. very long stretch where there's absolutely nothing but forest and highway. And that is it. Mm. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, speaking of, uh, <clears throat> trips, there was for some reason, a really weird treat, uh, tweet by, uh, oh God, I can't remember now. Former newscaster from global Leslie, Leslie Jordan? Roberts. Yeah. Leslie Roberts. He's kind of getting roasted for that one, isn't he? Yeah. Apparently the word went to some place in old Montreal. I mean, it's called old Montreal for a reason, right? Yes. It wasn't designed for cars. And apparently, uh, the big complaint is, you know, having to go down several one way streets and then having to park a full two blocks, blocks away from, from the, hotel, the boutique hotel from the yeah. boutique hotel. Uh, it's like, like, how do people, it's just so uncivilized like, dude, <laughs> type thing. And it's like, it's so precious. It's Montreal. I mean, it's summer. Everything is under construction. It's been like that for a hundred years. And it's old Montreal. Changing. And it's old Montreal's old. been like that since the, like, what, the 1600s? Yeah. It was I never mean, built for cars. Right? But it's for like, because it's not built that, you know, well, people that are coming from elsewhere, you know, they have to walk a little bit. What kind of impression does that give them to their city? It's like, yeah. And, and then somebody like underneath said, yeah, I mean, gee, like, Venice. I can't believe my, my, my time in Venice and those like, was all these people showed up and it's like, you know, it's like, I had to walk several blocks we couldn't drive anywhere. I'm like, and then somebody said, that's not the same. I'm like, actually, it's not far off from the truth. Old Montreal was built in an old European style. It was never built for automobiles. It was built for horse and cart because yeah. in the 1600s, there was no model T's. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying it's like, it's like, excuse me, Leslie, like maybe you've gotten a little soft, but, um, I walk more than two blocks just to get to the bus stop. Yeah, exactly. In my city. <laughs> but then again, you know, I took a bus, you know, Ottawa to Vancouver return when I was in my twenties. So maybe I'm made of stronger stock. Uh, apparently. Yeah. He got, he got ratioed pretty hard for that. One. <laughs> I mean, it's people like, weren't shitting on him, but they were kind of like, dude, really? Really? Like, all the well, things. Basically saying Montreal is an unvisitable city. I mean, you know, it's like if we like, really? Then, then stay in, in the newer part of Montreal and not old Montreal. Uh, Go stay at the Ritz Carlton where you can drive right up to the front door. I mean, these are boutique hotels in old Montreal. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. First world problems. Yeah. Speaking of hotels. Yeah. Justin yes. chilling at the Holiday Inn. Hotel, <laughs> motel, Holiday Inn. <laughs> uh, it, apparently, the uh, Sudbury Holiday Inn is a lavish place to stay, according to the uh, Reform Party or the Conservative Reform. <laughs> the sea crap. PMN peeps. Lavish and swanky plan. retreat at a Sudbury Holiday Inn. Making policy for the election. <laughs> Chingy and little Snoop Dogg. And like, come on, man. Okay. So the complaint is that the, that, okay, there's two complaints. Number one, Justin Trudeau, yes, who's telling people he's not doing anything, mm -hmm. had his itinerary for the day saying that there was nothing. And then after he had a meeting with, I guess, the team from the Sudbury area, he put it on his agenda, did this. And it's like, he's lying to people. Okay, first of all, the meeting with the team from Sudbury isn't actually a public event. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not like anybody was denied a press opportunity or an opportunity to get some clicks or whatnot. It was an internal party thing. Number two, apparently, lavish stay. Swanky. The swanky Holiday Inn Sudbury. Now, the thing that makes this even more freaking ridiculous and, okay, remember how in the Trump campaign 2016, whenever they would make an accusation, mm -hmm. right, there was literally a tweet for everything. Everything. Every damn thing. Absolutely damn everything okay we are in that era right and, and now getting to the absurd level yes now like, it's, look, this is no knock against Sudbury by the way 
no, no. A beautiful community. But I don't think anybody in Sudbury would describe the describe the Holiday Inn as lavish or swanky. And I don't even think the Holiday Inn would be offended when we say, I wouldn't describe it as lavish or swanky. Nice no. accommodations, clean, comfortable, exactly what you're looking for. But lavish and swanky? It's not the Ritz-Carlton, my friends. It's a Holiday Inn. And, and Holiday Inn has pulled up their socks in the last 20 years, changed their game, rebranded, like redid all their hotels but again it's not a fancy lavish resort <laughs> oh they're just they're just trying to dig up anything they can to stir the pot mm -hmm. who's dividing canadians the most i mean really oh yeah oh yeah so but here's the thing okay with with in, in his case it's not that there's a tweet for everything uh but an event or something for everything and it seems that this very same lavish allegedly holiday inn mm. is the exact same holiday inn that the conservatives held a retreat in I think in July, 2023, oh, or maybe just this July. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the tweet for some reason. I thought I had to find it. Bookmark yeah, it. Afraid, afraid. Um, but yes, it's the, the, they were, they were there now the, and I will find it and I will be able to show it to you. Get some cups, but then you have Charlie Angus as well going, okay, so let me get this straight. Pierre Polyev, who lives in a 19-room mansion with private chef paid for by the taxpayers, is pissed that the PM visited the Holiday Inn in Sudbury. Our 24-7 rage boy needs to touch grass. <laughs> I love that Charlie Angus has gotten, on that, got, gotten in on that one. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, like, again, yeah, the whole sort of, like, conservatives are weird thing. They're playing right into it. What? <laughs> when you live in it... When you live in a 19 room mansion and you are complaining about the other guy hosting a lavish. I just, I can't. I, I can't. Now, here's the thing. I finally found it. Um, in the Sudbury Star, and this is yes. Luc, Luc Lebrun uh, that found this uh, from yeah. uh, Press Progress. Um, January 13th, 2024. The event will be held at the Holiday Inn Regent Street starting at 6.30 p.m. It's a private event, so attend. You must register at conservative.ca Sudbury. <laughs> so it's lavish when the liberals are there, but when, <laughs> when the conservatives are there, it's not? <laughs> they were there this year. Make it make sense. This very year. They really don't have very yeah, smart people in that party, do they? To, to, to literally, to, look, it was this year. This, this lavish party, we just talked about the article in The Breach. It's like, what happens when Frank Stronach and Conrad Black or whatever, like this, you know, <laughs> throw a party, a fundraiser for Pierre Pontiac, his yes. tour of the lifestyles of the rich and, of the Canadian rich and famous, his most luxurious and swanky, Come on, man. I'm against the lobbyists. And then he has like God knows how many secret meetings with lobbyists. I mean, it's just this guy is just too damn much. Well, so I saw a tweet from somebody I've been following. We follow each other. I'm not going to say who this person is. The other day I saw this tweet and and uh, this person sort of heaped some praise on Polyev about how Polyev understands blah, 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 blah. And a lot of people's response was just a line of question marks. Like what, what, what we, I, I didn't say anything. Cause I was like, is this sarcastic? I don't know. Or if it's something that had to be put out because this person works for, has a high position in a union. And I, I don't know what the hell is going on, but it struck me as odd because a, we all know he doesn't give a shit about unions. He doesn't. No. 
There's never been a piece of anti-worker legislation, except for the anti-scab thing. Yeah. Just recently, yeah. in his whole twenty-year career, career, twenty-year career, up until just before the end of this session, that he has not been able to vote against fast enough. Exactly. <laughs> this is the, this ain't the guy that's going to give you freedom or powerful paycheck. But according to the the Timmons today, um, it was described as this is the way they did it. To I have to do it in his voice, even though it's mm, from the Conservative Party. Today, Justin Trudeau took a surprise trip up to Sudbury to appease his liberal MPs from Ontario at their swanky retreat before the summer ends, where they will discuss ways to make life more costly and miserable for Ontarians, especially those in Northern Ontario. Yes, they've met to, in order to discuss ways to make our lives more... No, no that, that's you guys. That's you guys. That's projection. <laughs> it's very much projection. That's projection, my friends. Um, yeah. So uh, the Liberal Party is having uh, Ontario caucus meetings. They began on Wednesday. Uh, they concluded, I'm going to guess, yesterday. Yeah. Based on this uh, report. Uh, Sudbury.com. Sudbury.com again. Uh, reached out to uh, the Conservative spokesperson, Sebastian Skamsky. Again, and uh, for insight regarding the Conservatives' use of the word swanky and lavish to describe the Liberal Sudbury retreat, but did not receive a response, of course. Uh, all political parties have caucus meetings, and so they and they just so happen to be here this year. Nick Belt, Liberal MP, uh, Nickel Belt, a Liberal MP, Marc Serre's office clarified in a written response, quote, these meetings are standard, not sure where they get their benchmark status of lavish. Uh, well, Here's what the benchmark status of lavish is. If it's anything that the prime minister is doing or involved with, it's lavish. Mm -hmm. If it's anything Pierre is doing, it's common sense. Well, right. So, so let's, so let's the, examine, those are the rules now. Let's examine Pierre Polyev. This is from an article from Niagara Now. Uh, it's written by Richard Haley, the editor in chief. I got to read a couple of lines from this story. This is from August 14th, so two days ago. This is from Wednesday, right? Wednesday, Thursday? Anyway, Wednesday. Wednesday. Pierre Polyev made a stop in Niagara-on-the-Lake last Thursday. Okay. Here's a leader who at first might seem informed, capable of holding rational arguments and making good points, but what he's really the best at is pandering, lying, and misleading. He panders to a crowd that's so anti-liberal they're willing to eat up and digest anything he says. He's hoping that voters so dislike Justin Trudeau that they won't see beyond his simplistic bumper sticker rhetoric. Here are a few examples of just how good Polyev is at spinning webs of lies that sound to the ill-informed like truth. And warning, there's a lot of purposeful misleading and contradiction to unpack here, but it's all closely related, so bear with us. Firstly, we asked him what his party would do to ensure it supports local journalism. His answer? Free speech. I'm going to repeal the censorship laws, make it possible for Canadian news to be visible again on Facebook, Instagram, and all other social media platforms, he said. And get rid of the terrible censorship laws that have taken those news stories down from the internet and deprived independent local media to have a voice. Okay, let's digest this. There's no such thing as a censorship law. Full stop. We assume, uh, assume he's referring to the Online News Act, Bill C-18, which is aimed to ensure that dominant platforms compensate news businesses when their content is made available on their services. In other words, when big players like Google or Meta share news content created by Canadian media companies and benefits from the billions of views those stories produce, then companies like Google must pay for that privilege. The law is simple, fair, and in the best interest of Canadian journalism organization, and something Google has agreed to, by the way. The only censorship being done is solely by Meta, which runs Facebook and Instagram. The company has not agreed to pay its fair share, and in response to the laws Canada passed to help ensure journalism organizations get paid, it has banned Canadian news on its platform. This uh, show the core values of companies like Meta are not to help you, but to exploit you. So to recap, Polyev calls Bill C-18 a censorship law, which it absolutely is not. He's being blatantly misleading, and to the average uninformed voter who doesn't understand it, it could seem true. We mean this with as little offense pos as possible, but he's relying on his voter base to not be smart enough to know the difference. 
it might sound good and pander to the right people to say he's fighting for free speech, but in reality, we already have freedom of expression thanks to the Charter of Rights. The next of his lies ties directly in with the lies we just discussed. We asked a question about the future of the local journalism initiative, a government-funded program that pays salaries of many journalists across the country. His response? It is terrible how local journalism has done under nine years of Trudeau. He's tried to take it over and basically wants everyone to work for the government so that he can have regurgitated propaganda paid for by taxpayers. This is completely false. The Trudeau government has funded the local journal, uh, journalism initiative, yes, but let's digest this too. As editors of a journalism organization, we can simply say it's not terrible how local journalism has done under nine years of Trudeau. In fact, the LJI program is one of the reasons local journalism can thrive in small communities, often calls, called news deserts because they have no local coverage. They don't have a big newspaper and often issues go uncovered because of a lack of reporters covering the area. Secondly, the notion that Trudeau wants every, everyone to work for the government and has propaganda placed in newspapers is simply ridiculous. Firstly, LJI reporters don't work for the government. They work for the news organizations that receive the funding. The only person who ever tells reporters what to write about is their editor. Notably, several conservative-leaning news outlets receive the same funding. And secondly, the notion that any legitimate newspaper would simply print propaganda for any party is ludicrous. We won't even print a news release without asking questions and vetting the information as some local Niagara Lake media organizations regularly do. You will never find verbatim liberal or conservative news releases in our paper or from any party. If we did, the majority of the paper would be conservative MP Tony Baldinelli's constant criticism of the liberals and the liberals constantly tooting their own horns. Note how we just criticized Baldinelli's approach even though he advertises with us. That's how journalism works. Advertising with us buys you an ad, not favorable coverage. The story goes on, but that's basically the... No, keep right. reading it. Keep reading yeah. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I can keep going then. It's, it's a good story. It's just, yep. The real, reality is local news is the least partisan news you'll find anywhere because we report on municipal council and local politicals who are not beholden to any political party. Our ideals are our own. They are carefully thought out with the best interest of the whole community in mind and have nothing to do with funding from a government program. For Polyev to suggest newspapers like ours are only liberal-leaning because we receive funding from the LJI program is insulting, out of touch with reality, and just another way to pander to people who lack critical thinking skills. Does he think that if he keeps the program running, news outlets are going to magically turn conservative because we're so grateful? It's almost cute how ignorant he must be. He would like you to believe Justin Trudeau is funneling orders to organizations like the Lake Report. It's simply not true. And the worst part is that Polyev must be smart enough to know it. He's just hoping you buy his baloney. Perhaps he is afraid that with a healthy media, he will continue to be called out on his lies and misleading statements, exactly like what we're doing here. Next, we asked him point blank what he plans to do with the LGA program. His answer was that media should be funding itself and do what media have done for, I don't know, 3,000 years? Simply, we, ask, we have to ask... How out of touch a person can be when from one side of their mouth they're saying they would repeal laws that give media fair compensation from giants like Google and Meta, and on the other side he says those organizations should be funding themselves entirely. With one, income, one hand he's cutting our income flow and giving it to billionaires, and with the other he's criticizing media for not being able to make enough money and saying the government shouldn't be helping keep an essential democratic function alive. He goes on, and now, of course, media, media and journalism is stronger than ever today because we have the Internet, which allows for more voices to reach Canadians, and that competition is positive. We can't have the government try to shut down composition just to favor those who favor the political viewpoint of Justin Trudeau. Again, there's a lot to unpack here. Firstly, did he just say media and journalism is, is, is doing better than ever? We thought he just said how much we're all suffering under Trudeau. Can't this guy make up his mind? He's just pandering again. So don't take anything he says too seriously, people. Secondly, the government isn't trying to shut down anyone. The government is trying to help keep local journalism organizations alive, largely because real journalists are the only one who will give you the whole story. Citizen, journal citizen journalism, in quotations, like you see on TikTok and Facebook, created by amateurs who don't really know what balanced journalism is, is often littered with untruths accompanied by half-baked opinions, and in general, isn't really news. Citizen journalism, a term that shouldn't 
even really exists because it isn't journalism, and I agree, doesn't usually cover council meetings. If it does, it often comes with bias. It doesn't continue to follow stories to the end. It often convicts people before a court can. There are a litany of problems with citizen journalism, and Polyev's mindset that journalism is doing just fine because every Bob and Sue can post on Twitter is not appropriate for someone who wants to run this country. Run it into the ground is more like it. We realize this is probably the longest editorial we've ever published, yet it might be one of the most necessary editorials yet, because one of Polyev's tactics is to throw out so much mis misinformation that it's almost impossible to fact check it all, especially on the spot. It's why he often appears to eat journalists and other politicians alive, because he's on another planet, and it's almost impossible to have a rational conversation with someone who just makes things up. Yep. So it's our duty as a free press one that isn't going to take anything at face value from any political party to call out Polyev's dangerous lives or his inability to comprehend the truth. Either he's lying to you and knows it, or he's just incompetent. And because he's not a stupid man, it's not hard to figure it out if you think, think critically about what he says. I mean, that, that is a great <laughs> article because he yep. nailed it. And it was That's... Ryan, <clears throat> Ryan Turn, MP Ryan Turnbull who uh, uh, tweeted that. Yep. And that uh, was written by uh, Richard Harley, the editor in chief of Niagara Now. Yes. So we have Sudbury.com. Mm -hmm. We have Niagara Now. I would guess, this is a guess, that Sudbury.com also maybe gets some funds from the LGI. LGI, yeah. LGI. Yeah, no doubt. Um, this is why local journalism matters. Correct. And, and remember, folks. We are not journalists. We nope. don't, we're not citizen journalists. We're not journalists. We don't purport to be. We don't pretend to be. We are not that. We are curators, commentators, and analyzers. Analysts. That is it. That is That's it. it. We are not journalists. We, we do not we make news. Never we call do not break news. That. We do not. No. Nope. I mean, I guess we do. We can break news. I mean, again, when Kit John came to our show and told us about what was going on in that long-term residence. Yes. Like this, that was breaking news. But I mean, we don't. It's not our mission, no. <laughs> right? Um, we're there to, you know, analyze, curate, you know, hopefully provide some media, so, uh, social media and political literacy, little information on civics along the way. Um, some, you know, pointing out ideas lies from politicians and mistakes that politicians make and, and things that politicians, like I said yesterday, we're calling out the current federal government because of the temporary foreign worker program. Yep. Um, you know, uh, and things of the like, right? Well, why explain why things are BS or whatnot? Just giving you the tools that you need and the information that you need in order to be able to make a clear decision when you go and vote, because so many are trying to interfere with your right to cast a fully informed yes. vote, right? So you got this. He doesn't want those little. So anybody, the conservative spin is that anything that receives any type of funding from the government of Canada in some way, either through a fund that's administered by third parties or arm's length by the government, is therefore directly under the control of the federal government. Mind you, if we remember, if we're old enough, a time when the conservatives were in government and almost all of the board members of CBC were donors to the Conservative Party of Canada. Just allow that to sink in for a bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there, uh, everything's a lie. Everything's projection. Yes. And so he doesn't want these small little outlets to exist because, well, they're not under the yes. thumb of the U S conglomerate vulture capital media, whatever hedge fund things. Um, and then he doesn't want the CBC to exist even though the numbers and the ratings from the Olympics are absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like seven out of 10 Canadians watched. And just well, nothing but praise pretty much for the, uh, the coverage. I mean, you got the, the negative people with well, the negative accounts on Twitter that are just going to be negative for the sake of being negative. Because but most people painful. really appreciated the coverage. Most people had nothing but wonderful things to say about Devin, about Shireen, about Scott Russell, uh, about the availability and all the events. Some people are saying this like, it's almost like there was too much because literally they covered everything. Every you should single, watch every, every single, single event on Gem in its entirety, beginning to end. So, and you can still do it because it's, it'll be there for a while. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't get to watch it when it happened, you still have time. Um, 
you know, we're far from the days that you have to watch the event only on one channel, jumping back and forth from events to events. This when it's on, like this, or you know, if you had a VCR and you could record it, a what? This, or else you'd miss it. <laughs> Sorry, a VCR. But, but that's like. Right. Sorry, I just haven't heard that in a long time. I know, but that was the thing, right? It's like if yeah. the, the event was on at six and if you weren't there, if you didn't have a yep. VCR, you missed it. You missed it. There was yeah. no reruns. There was no internet yeah. to go look it up after. There was yeah. no, he, the, the, the newspapers weren't like from Harry Potter land. It's not, they had like, they didn't have moving pictures so that you could watch it. Yeah, so you, little newspapers. So mm-hmm. you had to be there or you had to have put that tape in the VCR and hope that the tape didn't get eaten and you had to get like yeah. this or that the, the, nothing was delayed because you only had like two hours or if you put it on extra long play six hours of recording and the event was happening like during that time or else you missed it you missed it you didn't see what everybody else was talking about so we're we're, we're far away from that era so oh, indeed so we probably have the best coverage in the world. There's literally everything, literally everything. So, uh, of course, you know, as we're mentioning on the show, maybe that's why you waited till 107 minutes before the uh, uh, beginning of the closing ceremonies to say anything, because had he said anything, well, then he would be attracting people to go and watch the CBC. Yes, which he can't have, right? Oh my God, look at this Canadian did such a wonderful performance. Oh, really, Pierre? Well, gee, you know, the three in 10 who just slavishly follow everything that the conservative party tells them to do and doesn't really think about it like this. Gee, well, maybe I should go check that out if Pierre praised it. Oh, but that means I have to go to CBC. Well, I have to take a shower when I'm done. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, if I watch the Olympics on CBC, will I suddenly like be corrupted and vote liberal? Is my mind so weak? I don't know. Oh, maybe just not watch it at all. Make sure that we're safe. You know, because watching leads to dancing and dancing leads to touching. And you know what happens when you start dancing and touching. Yeah. That's how babies are made. Yeah. (laughs) So watch the Olympics if you're conservative on CBC and you'll you'll wake up pregnant. (laughs) that's the way that's the way conservative logic right that that's we had that on fox right it's like if you vote for a woman you'll become a woman jesse well, waters seriously yeah, i know that's that's where they are today well <laughs> wait, wait wait till i show you this you'll you'll like this it's just a photo it's just a photograph hey, with, with it's next oh my God. it's got a picture of uh, uh of um, two uh accomplished uh, women when the first black female president is sworn in by the first black female Supreme Court justice using hey. Abraham Lincoln's Bible on Martin Luther King Day, hey. conservative heads will explode. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be here for it with a tub of popcorn so large that I can swim laps in it. You know those things of like Scrooge McDuck when he's like diving into a pool of all of his money and like swimming and blowing coins out me mm. with popcorn <laughs> all right um oh my god now the other I thing to, i have to show you this quickly and then we'll just we'll go ahead i just got to show you this because it's a uh it's uncanny it says uh uncanny resemblance scott Baio will have his first role in decades if they ever do a Ghislaine maxwell movie oh my god isn't that disturbing oh my god that is <laughs> Like they just did a face swap, right? Wow. Like, yeah, good point. It's the same eyebrows, same look in the eye. It's like yeah, yeah. down to the facial. Like, whoa, oh, yeah, yeah. whoever researched that one. Good on you. Because normally when you get one of those pictures, like I've seen that with like art tableaus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People go to art galleries and say, oh my God, this person looks like, and then they take a picture and they make the same face or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But this, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So. Now, here's this other thing we mentioned. We talked about it uh, yesterday a little bit, that um, huh, people are, the media seem to believe that the Prime Minister of Canada um, should make it as easy as possible 
for them to cover him mm -hmm. uh, by letting him know everywhere he's going to be before he's there. Um, this was not a normal thing. This was something that the prime minister tried to do to provide more transparency, and it came with a cost. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, a, a very high cost. Yeah. And I showed you some tweets, and then I showed you this, I believe, yesterday. Where I'm sit there, and if you all read it. For his part, conservative, conservative leader Pierre Polyev will also clock in another day on the hustings in Atlanta, Canada. But his office has once again declined to provide any details of his itinerary. Now, the use of once again in mm -hmm. this sentence would lead one to believe that this is, if not a habitual thing, not a rare thing. Common occurrence. Common occurrence. But for some reason, you have the Paul Wells of the world and other journalists. And he goes, it's like, he's lying to people about where he's going. And he's like, we can't. So why? Because you can't cover him from the comfort of your living room and you would actually have to get up and do some legwork to get your story because he's not spoon feeding it and delivering it to you so that you can twist it yeah because again to tell people that he is lying Choosing not to disclose where you are going, making a choice, is not the same as lying. And I find it interesting how quickly the mainstream media is to refer to it as lying when it's liberals, while making no mention of Pierre being just as secretive, rather, rather than lying, it mm -hmm. is adjusting to compensate for risks to or threats upon one's life. Yeah. And this is uh, Andrew Coyne. Oh, of course, Andrew Coyne uh, has me somewhat locked on of course he does. that account. Hold on. I can find it. If not, you can find it to me. Because there's a, I'm not blocked. Well, no, but there's a, there's a show account and then there's the, the, there's my personal account. And, Andrew Coyne has right. me blocked on my personal account because I dared contradict him with a fact. Um, oh, no. but, oh, yes. Uh, the, the, there, are, there are a few like that. Paul mm. Wells also has me blocked because I dared contradict him with a fact. <laughs> um, Look, don't, but, don't let facts get in the way of my good story. Yeah. What, so what does uh, Andrew Coyne have to say? This is um, Canada, August 2024. The PM is traveling about the country in secret leaving his staff to lie to the press about his whereabouts. Still, at least he met with some of his caucus. Until lately, he was hiding from them as well. Andrew Coyne. Really? Okay, there are two attributions of intent and motive here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand that editorialists are not reporters. Mm -hmm. And editorialists are supposed to supply opinion. But opinion is still supposed to be based on fact and be reasonable. Lying implies intent. Yes. He is traveling about the country in secret. Yes. Why would that be, Andrew? Why well, would that be? When he was on vacation. Yes. Leaving his staff to lie to the press about his whereabouts, not disclosing is not lying. Correct. Saying that he is doing, he's taking a private day is not lying. Saying that he's taking a private day and he decides that he's going to show up at Pride. Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, you know what? That's up to him. Would it be better if we were able to disclose? Yes. It would be for the transparency. But, Certain people have decided to talk like this about the prime minister all the time and worse, right? Until lately, he was hiding from his caucus as well. Was he? No. Do, do we know this for a fact that he was hiding or did he just take a much needed vacation? 
his family has kind of been through a lot. So there are, this is the thing that I call filling the blanks with that which one needs slash wishes slash wants to be true in order to fuel a narrative. I am pretty sure that Andrew Coyne has no inside track as to whether or not these are lies. I am sure that he has no inside track into what the prime minister's motive was for not having an anticipatory meeting, as people described, given that there were regional retreats planned and that there is a national retreat planned as well. And on that, getting back to the original story for a little bit, just touching on it again, when a Sudbury.com asked Conservative spokesperson Sebastian Skamsky how much the Conservative Party of Canada's September 2023 policy convention and caucus meeting in Quebec City cost taxpayers, right? Because Skamsky not only uh, said that this meeting here at the swanky Holiday Inn was a problem, but he decided to pre-criticize the national retreat that is going to be happening in Vancouver as being uh, something that will be lavish. Lavish. Um, well, the, the Conservative Policy Convention 2023 in Quebec City uh, cost taxpayers according to a House of Commons bill reported by the CBC, $426,283, including $331,699 for travel, $71,408 for accommodations, and $21,053 for meals and incidentals. Mm. And then Scamsey criticized other quote, lavish getaways that the Liberals have embarked on, such as a September 2022 caucus meeting in St. Andrews, New Jordan, Brunswick, which he said cost at least $428,000, and a September 2023 caucus meeting in London, which cost $314,000, quote, that we know about so far. Well, uh, from what I can see here uh, is that uh, it's pretty much in the same ballpark. Yours was $426,283 in 2023. Theirs was $428,000 in 2022 at inflation. Yours was more. <laughs> not statistically significantly more, but it was more. Uh, so, maybe and it was way more than the Bacacus meeting in London. So that's over a hundred thousand dollars more. Yeah. Um. Yes. Uh. You know. Oh, sorry. The the Liberal Party retreat is not taking place in Vancouver, but on Vancouver Island. Correct. On uh, Vancouver in September, Island. and the caucus retreats in September is pretty much the usual thing. Mm -hmm. They do the barbecue circuit, flip some pancake, pancakes, shake some hands, flip some burgers, all that kind of stuff. They go to places, they show up at prides, they show up at community festivals like Caravana or Filipino festival or something like that along the way. Usually there are some events that require their attention that happen here and there. And then they all get together sometime in September and they have a big retreat all together to prepare for the next session, their strategies, their plans, the policies, how they're going to handle things. Right? There's a schedule. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every September we're talking about caucus retreats. They're all billed to the taxpayers for all the parties. Yes. And the Quebec one from the Conservatives, if I remember correctly, was a little controversial because it seems that many MPs uh, brought family members to it and billed us for that travel. Yes. And that is not uh, what the things are supposed to be used for. No. No, that's, uh, that's abuse of the system. Yep. So that's, that's overtaking the entitlements and taking on more than you're allowed. Yep. So not really cool. So Andrew Coyne did this whole, this whole ascribing of intent. He's lying. He's hiding from his people, all of this stuff. And again, when we say, why is this? When we ask why this is, right? I think it was July 27th, two people were arrested for threats made against the Prime Minister, Christopher Freeland, and Jagmeet Singh. July 25th, I think two days earlier, was the day that the Prime Minister was ambushed on the beach by Kian Bexty. After they trailed, tracked his plane 
on the beach where the Prime Minister was on vacation time with his family, with his security detail. I guess having to split in two yes. so that there would be people around the Prime Minister and people taking care of his son. Because who knows who else, may, who else might have shown up. We don't know. Now, I'm not ascribing that, saying that Keen Bexty had that type of malicious intent. No. He had malicious intent, clearly. But not this type of malicious intent. But the point is, is if that situation can happen, then the security detail has to be prepared as if there could be that type of malicious intent, as if the intrepid, self-styled journal, citizen journalist, as we said, he's not. He's not. I'm a journalist. Might not be working alone. I think of Ralph Wiggum. I'm a journalist. <laughs> That's who Key and Vext is, although he looks like a Nazi Caillou, so there's the... the, the, the uh, so... And then, just a couple of days ago, another person was arrested. So this is since July 25th. He gets ambushed, Two people are arrested on one day, and then another person is arrested. In that context, right? It's almost like, and why can't Johnny read? Well, you know, there's a context. Because on the Hill, they're recommending that the RCMP once again have more jurisdiction on the Hill rather than just parliamentary precinct police. The RCMP is proposing that at the moment. Yes. So we know that there are threats. We know that there's online violence. We know that people are taking it uh, a little too seriously and mm-hmm. acting on it, like the guy who tried to follow Christian Freeland into the elevator, or David Menzies who tried to accost her on the street, or David Menzies who got booted out of Conservative Party of Canada events for Michelle Lanzman and other people. and Right? Swarms of people that are organized to show up at events when people are on campaign. They take a bus and they go there and they follow with, I guess, and then they heckle and they make it impossible for the politician to actually do their event. We've seen this going on. A whole bunch of people take the city downtown Ottawa hostage for nearly four weeks. Yes. Demanding a friendly conversation with the prime minister, after which he would hopefully step down and that's assuming that they didn't want a friendly conversation with the prime minister like the january 6th has wanted a friendly conversation with mike pence and nancy pelosi but no no like, let's forget that all that happened and let's just say the prime minister is being secretive he's forcing people to lie and he's hiding from people i'm if you are always, always beating the drum of the worst possible motive, what do you effing think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. If you keep on describing someone who's just trying to do their job and live their life, Every time they get on a plane, they go to somewhere, they're a hypocrite on the environment. If every time they have to say no to something female, they're a fake feminist. Yeah. That comes from if every time they have to get together or the job costs some money, they have a caucus retreat, they're screwing you over. If every time there's a security threat, they choose not to say something, they're lying to you. If you're always ascribing to someone the absolute worst of motive and intent, and you are doing it in an asymmetrical way because the leader of the opposition party is doing the same damn thing, but you're only criticizing one. You're only cruising one of lying. What are you doing? You're being stochastic. Yes. And then if the people that do that and then add terms like devil, demon, pedo, Mm -hmm. again, as I asked on the show many times, What do you do with evil? What is the solution to evil? 
You stomp it out. You eradicate it. You eliminate it. It is stochastic. So journalists, again, if you are going to report this way and your politicians decide to adjust and make it harder to do your job, don't get mad now. When you should have gotten mad is when you had other politicians who were doing the stochastic shit or laughing at people mocking them in their faces like Doug Ford did the other day with the veterinarian stuff. And you stand there and you don't stop and say, like the journalists here from Niagara Now, what the... Oh, no, wait a minute. That's bullshit. Yeah. Call it out. Your Every job is to call bullshit. And yes, you know what? It might cut off your access. So what do you But everything's about? on YouTube. You might not be able to ask a question, but you can still report on the story. You can still report on what they say. And if enough of you are blocked access from mainstream media, that itself becomes a story that's embarrassing for the people to do. There's all, and they, those people, as much as they say they don't need you, they do. Because you're the ones that have the best cameras, the best everything for the snazziest, shiniest clips. Then they're the ones that they want. Mm -hmm. They want your work. They keep on bashing you, but they keep on taking your work and using it, don't they? Well, so they evident. must see some value in it, don't they? So yeah. act like your work has value and remember your job and your duty to your audience. Your duty is to your audience, not mm -hmm. to those you are covering. Correct. And that seems to be a forgotten over the last couple of years. And it, it's really gotten to be so annoying. It, you know, we can cite a hundred examples of this, but we've witnessed it personally, witnessed it alive as it's happening on CPAC. And it, it reminds me of his whole apple munching thing. What page? What page? Show me the page. Give me the page. What page is that? Like my response would have been, it's a turn of phrase when we said you took a page from their playbook. There's no actual fucking page, you arsehole. And then, of course, I would have got dragged out of there really quickly. But that would have been my response. There's no goddamn actual page. Stop being an obtuse asshole. You know there's no physical page. You know that. You're just acting like Trump. You're spitting the same things as him. Oh, what? Tell me specifically what? Quote it word for word. Tell me if exactly. I literally said the same thing. Yeah. Oh, no, I said there's here. one word difference in my sentence. I did not it say here. it. You're right. You made one word difference. Please tell me how that changes everything. It's a distinction without a meaningful difference. But it creates an opportunity for say, ah, oh, you're not being accurate. See, you're in the pocket. Duty to audience. Exactly. Uh, Kit uh, T. Wigmore. Yes. And please, someone rediscover the art of asking the painfully obvious follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Uh, we had another incident the other day. I think it was a, a journalist that was asking uh, the prime minister a question uh, about something and he was saying, like, like, Joe Biden shut you down on something. Yes. And the prime minister was sitting there and was like, um, no, sir, that was directed at you not me i said it's like we were all here for this this thing when it happened that comment was directed to you you were the one being shot down by biden not me it's like and again is not the ability to follow the to and fro of a conversation accurately an essential skill for being a journalist. So if you're in a room and somebody is being shut down and that person is you and you don't notice it's you, you think it's directly at someone else, um, I'm not that confident in your reporting. Your observational skills to tell me what it is that you saw with your eyes and heard with your ears. I'm, uh, we need better. <laughs> we need so much better. Um, here it is, uh, Mr. Grizzly. I have that clip for you here. No, you want to play okay. it for the, the kids? 
Um, this is uh, Adrian Morrow from the Globe and Mail uh, at this point, who was uh, doing this. And Prime Minister just casually, but did put him in his place. <laughs> uh, just, just bear with me for a second here. Just trying to get a couple of links here fixed, and I will be right with you, sir. My apologies. I was trying to do three things at once, and sometimes I, I fail at it. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I succeed. Sometimes I fail. Okay, I've got the clip queued up here. Let me just get it all situated from the very beginning, and we will uh, we'll have a look at this, because this is actually really good, the way he did it and what he did. Mm -hmm. Check this out. This is, this is, um, this is great. The Globe and Mail. Yeah, Prime Minister, Joe Biden shut you down today when you uh, basically said that he didn't want to talk about the EV thing until after it gets through Congress, you know, at, at a point when the legislation is already going to be, you know, sort of, sort of set. I mean, how disappointed are you or how disappointed should Canadians be that, you know, you came down here with a pretty straightforward request, uh, you know, stop trying to violate this trade deal we signed with you. And the president basically said, don't want to talk about it. Actually, Adrian, he was talking to you when he said that. Uh, uh, when, when the journalist asked him if he was going to talk about that to them, he said, no, we're going to talk about it uh, in this conversation. And I had an opportunity, I had, I had an opportunity to chat with him exactly about this and express uh, my very real concerns about this. So um, yeah, we, we will continue. Uh, to make representations to the Americans on how integrated our uh, vehicle market and vehicle production facilities are in uh, between Canada and the United States and have been for over 50 years uh, and we will continue to. So what, what did Joe Biden tell you then if he, if he said, okay, we are going to negotiate, we're not going to wait until the end of the legislative process, what was it that he told you then? Uh, we talked about how uh, we need to find solutions moving forward, uh, but those conversations will continue to be ongoing. So. Here, here's the thing I want you to take note of there. In case Compare you and contrast with PP. Kind, courteous, polite, soft-spoken. He corrected him. He corrected him, but he did so in a very polite manner. And then answered his follow-up. And, and, and not only that, he did it very diplomatically. Did you notice that? Oh, yes. And just like the soft hand, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this, you had your turn. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just as he was trying to interrupt it like this just and just just the hand no no as he kept talking so right but well, that's, like that's, i said i mean he's been doing this for nine years he's good i know at that it now. i know he's that good at it now yeah but it's like and then after the next question rather than continuing mm -hmm. like this as the other guy does by berating even more or on like this actually answered, answered the question didn't cut him off, didn't rule him reporter non grata. Didn't and you can it. tell by the way he asked the first question, the words being chosen. Mm -hmm. Like this, he shut you down. How do you feel? He's going, like, he's not asking it was a, a content or a substance question. No. It's like, tell me about your feelings about having been shut down. And I'm going to go right, right about, oh, he felt the like prime minister humiliated or embarrassed or like this, rather than about what the subject was because that's a juicier story and it's an easier story to write and it's a story that doesn't recommend that it require that you do that much research because doing the other story about the actual policy means that you have to go and research the policy and compare the positions and understand it and analyze it whereas prime minister gets humiliated by president biden doesn't has no time for him like this, our standing in the world is declining much easier story to write. You don't need to call anybody. Yeah. You don't need to research anybody. You don't have to get any facts. You don't have to look at statistics. You don't have to look at things over time. Your job is not to pick the easy narrative, journalists. Your job is to do the legwork. Dig, get the facts, and as Niagara now says, report the whole truth as best you can with the best information you can get after doing the most diligent, meticulous work you can to obtain it. Correct. That's why there's a difference between actual journalists and citizen journalists, because actual journalists hold themselves to that code. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. personal code. And yeah, given cool. that the value of your reputation is only as good as your word and your work when you're a journalist, 
this. You can do 15 years of good journalism and you can screw up one major important story and you will be remembered for that screw up for the rest of your career. Reputations take a long time to build and are very quickly easily destroyed. If you decide to get sloppy. All right. And this is a, a good quote too, uh, from, from Tavi G just pointed out. He didn't berate the organization behind the reporter either. Nope. Or you're, you're from the Globe and Mail. You're from the Globe and Mail. You, uh, you're, uh, you're uh, in the pocket of Pierre Pauly. N- nothing like that. Nothing like that. Yep. Just answered the question, corrected him for his incorrect statement, mm-hmm. and then answered the question and the follow up. Yep. Now, <clears throat> speaking of liberals, take notes, and this could apply to Ontario liberals as well. Mm-hmm. And maybe, hey, even, you know, BC NDP, Saskatchewan NDP, New Brunswick Liberals. Mm -hmm. Um, Take a look down south, because as a communications person, this, okay, might be in the little realm of TMI, but I almost had a spontaneous combustion orgasm. Yeah, that's the upon this. You want me to put this on the screen? <laughs> okay, I got to read that one. That's good. The Harris Waltz. For planning purposes, reluctantly, August 15th, 2024, media advisory. Today, Donald Trump to ramble incoherently and spread dangerous lies in public, but at a different home. Today at 4.30 p.m., Donald J. Trump, loser of the 2020 election by 7 million volts, votes will hold another public meltdown in Bedminster, New Jersey. Wow. <laughs> Date and time, Thursday, August 15th, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Venue, not a battleground state. Preview. Not so fresh off the National Association of Black Journalists, Florida, and Twitter glitches, Donald Trump intends to deliver another self-obsessed rant full of his own personal grievances to distract from his toxic Project 2025 agenda. On popular running mate and increasing detachment from reality of the voters who will decide this election. These remarks will not be artificial intelligence, but they certainly will lack intelligence. Banning abortion, (laughs) rising costs on families, confusing basic facts, cutting Social Security and Medicare, blocking border security, and being publicly unstable, unfit, and unwell will not help this struggling campaign for president. Tune in for the same old thing. Whoever is doing the comms for Harris Walls, please send some people up north. Yes. Please. This, this is how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. This is how you do comms, baby. I swear. Oh, They've got a bunch that. of Swifties on that team doing this. I swear to God. I see that H.A. is back to stir the pot. That's okay. Let him. Yeah, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Or her. Or, or her. We don't know. They, them. They, we don't know. We don't know. Yep. We, don't, we don't even care. Go Get ahead. Stir cubs. the pot. We'll you know what to do. Cubs just or you know what, you know what not to do. Exactly. Wow. That way? Yeah. But well, it's one of the things out. I and noticed. That is all we will talk about. That was all we will say. One of the things I noticed when I was in New Brunswick and chatting with people randomly was um, the Liberal Party is terrible at comms because all I hear, all I heard, and and I'm like, dude, so why do you hate Trudeau? Well, he hasn't done anything. In nine years, he's done nothing. I'm like, could you? That's not true. I'm like, what? Well, my life is worse because of him. Exactly. How is your life worse, please? And they go on to explain, and I go, well, no, that's mostly to do with your uh, local provincial premier blaine higgs who is a terrible human being oh yeah i hate that guy i know you hate that guy because he's a terrible human being i'm like he's the one making your life miserable i go all of those things you just cited to me are provincial responsibilities that's not federal what that's provincial not federal it's number one and number two you do realize that under this current government they have lifted more children out of poverty than anybody else in history they have uh, uh, lifted 145 drinking water advisories on reserves throughout the country. They're going to get them all done. It's taken longer than they planned, but we did have a global pandemic that got into the mix. We have a pharmacare program and a dental care program. Uh, let's not forget $10 a day daycare. Let's all not brought to you courtesy of the federal government. Let's not forget 
the free trade agreement with Europe, the free trade, new yes. free trade agreement with the United States. Correct. Let's not uh, forget the uh, CPTPP trade agreement. Let's not forget the legalization of marijuana and uh, the elimination of a certain number of criminal records. As a result, let's not forget the reinstatement of the census. Let's not forget uh, the protection of transgender Canadians under the Constitution. And tax yes. cuts for the lower, for the middle class, the working class, the working poor, and the poor, right across the board. Tax sure. cuts all the way along. Shoring up the CPP. Yes. Um, uh, oh, the and, and, and of the, spinning back the retirement age to 60, from 67 to 65. Yes. The beginnings of a Canada disability benefit, however horrible it is to start with. And that is one thing I have to say that HI and HA and us agree on because I read the comments after the show and uh, they did state that they believe that uh, what Doug Ford did in Ontario for uh, the, you know, raising the disability benefit by less than what inflation was, but still raising it uh, was pretty much an insult. So on that, we have a point of agreement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? So. He did raise it, but it was an insult. It, you know what? Uh, th that particular intervention was actually solid on its own. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the type of intervention that we that we want, like mm -hmm. the solid fact base and opinion based on actual fact, not an imaginary version of the world that Thereof. we want right. to be true in order to push a narrative. Um, so, like I said th there's there is there is some terrain for entente on certain things, because mm -hmm. which is why you know we didn't ban. Yep. So we're not, we only ban if people are treating people with disrespect because that's the rules here, right? We do not first assume the worst of each other. Yes. And we all assume that we are acting in good faith. Indeed. Yes. And the only reason why we don't is if you're here to try to disturb everybody's enjoyment because this should be everybody's place. And if, but if you're only here to post bait or to try to provoke fights, this is probably not the place for you, right? You have the whole rest of the internet for that. Knock yourself so, Kits and cubs, again, if there's bait, please do not respond. If there's a legitimate thing, go ahead. Have a pleasant, pleasant and respectful interaction. Right. All right. Now, uh, other news. Uh, this is, we're going to go to a little bit of entertainment news here uh, because, um, as we uh, know, uh, the world last uh, Canadian actor, uh, Matthew Perry. Yeah, I, I noticed he was and, uh, uh, trending. I just didn't have any chance yeah, to check sorry. it out. I just thought I'd put up a Lola camera right there. Yeah, she's, absolutely. Giving, she's mooning us. <laughs> so, yeah, she's sharing a lot there. Yeah, uh, she is um, a dog after all. Yes. So, uh, the reason Matthew Perry's in the news, and I will read this, is authorities in California say that they've uncovered an elaborate web of deceit and corruption in connection with the drug overdose of Matthew Perry last year. Five people, including two doctors and the star's personal assistant, face criminal charges in his death. So almost 10 months after he was found dead in the hot tub of his L.A. home, um, an extensive investigation into a group of people who took advantage of the actor's trust and preyed on his addiction. Um, the results of it were released. U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada, who was the lead prosecutor in the case, where five defendants have been charged, that invest investigation has revealed a broad underground criminal network responsible for distributing large quantities of ketamine to mm -hmm. Mr. Perry and others. Uh, now, if people don't know, uh, ketamine is typically a veterinary veterinary drug. It can Correct. be used in hospital settings as well when people have like lots of pain. But uh, you know, for example, it's a horse tranquilizer. Yeah, if you're going to the vet, let's say, and you have a cat that likes just like all over the place, they'll probably rub their nose a little bit in it, and then the cat will be like, you know calm while they need to do what they do and it wears off after like relatively quickly small amount wears off re relatively quickly but if you take too much of it like this what it does is it lowers and lowers and lowers your blood your blood pressure if you could take too much of it your heart can go boom the other thing that can happen though is that it becomes harder for you to move so you can mm -hmm. literally paralyze someone temporarily Correct. with ketamine so but what happens is that everything else functions your brain mm -hmm. functions normally you have all your thoughts and if you'd happen to do something like, for example, while you've over, while you've over consumed, throw up, 
you can't turn around. You can't. So you basically yeah. choke, choke on your own vomit. You drowned in You drown. So he must have slipped into it. Like this. He may have, may have taken too much and gotten to the, like he might have drowned in the pool as well if he yeah. did too, too much with heat. Because again, a hot tub will lower your blood pressure mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. that lowers your blood pressure. So that's when, the, when we're talking about, when we talk about harm reduction, for example, we talk about harm reduction for drug safe supply and whatnot. But the other part of harm reduction that's been going on, if you've ever been part of rave culture, is like, has been harm reduction with telling people, you know, these two drugs don't mix. So, for example, if you are alcohol is a depressant and ketamine is a depressant, for example, mm-hmm. and amyl nitrate, for example, is a depressant. If you take one with another, with another, you lower your blood pressure, lower your blood pressure, lower your blood pressure, your heart goes boom. Right? This drug does not interact with like If you take this drug with another drug, you are going to have a very, very, very bad trip. Please do not mix these two. And you go there and like in the bathrooms on the back of the stalls and the way, you know, on the, in the bathroom mirrors, whatnot, mm-hmm. you've got all this harm reduction information. If you've taken ecstasy, if you're at a rave, whether you feel like you have to go to the bathroom or not, go once an hour, drink lots of water. Because again, if you don't stay hydrated, your body overheats and then you mm-hmm. seize and think. So there's harm reduction. Right? And harm reduction, the principle is that people are going to do it anyway. We put on our big boy and big girl pants. We realize that the world is as it is. We live in the world that is, not in the world of should, that people are going to do it anyway. Let's give people the information who are going to do it anyway, the information to remain alive. Right? So that's where we're going with this. I just got a note here. uh, uh, Not necessarily a gentle correction, but uh, an authentication. Uh, All of the original 2015 era long-term water advisories have been cleared. What happened is some short-term ones have been promoted to long-term. Key part of the liberal approach is the water programs are indigenous-led for long-term stability. Uh, So all of the I don't know what the context for that is. The water advisories I talked about earlier. Oh, on the okay, yes, okay, yes. Sorry. Um, So uh, the network included two doctors, Perry's own personal assistant. Thanks, and a person known as the Ketamine Queen. From the height of uh, Matthew Perry's fame on Friends, the actor had always struggled with addiction. That was known. Investigators say that in the fall of 2023, his sobriety ended. Um, And his struggles with substance abuse returned with the help of two licensed doctors looking for profit. Using Perry's assistant, they sold him 20 vials of ketamine for $55,000 cash. One doctor seeing Perry as a golden opportunity. He wrote in a text message in September 2023, quote, I wonder how much this moron will pay. Uh, now, I don't know what the quality of that ketamine was and uh, how big were those vials. Um, but back in my days, my, my two full years that I spent in rave culture, um, 20 vials of ketamine was nowhere near $55,000. No, I think it got ripped off. Special K mm-hmm. is what they called it in the rave scene at the time. Yeah. It was either maybe about a thousand or two or something like that. But yeah. again, back then, those dollars are just for inflation. Yeah, yeah of course. Like but I mean, not that much. 5,000 maybe, but not 55. Well, they saw them as the, the golden calf, right? Yeah. Well, the other thing, there's a complicating factor there like it's, that you will see that makes it such that people uh, would want to pay that much. Um, Along with the struggles with substance abuse, even at the height of his fame, the acerbic actor wrestled with depression, had begun using ketamine therapy for his condition. When his doctors wouldn't increase the dosage, he went looking for others. So ketamine, that's why he was willing to pay. Yeah. It wasn't, do you have some? Because it would be fun for the party tonight. No, okay, fine, I'll do without it. It's... I bond this therapy and I need to, uh, I want more because the dose that I'm having is doing some good. And if I take more, it'll be more good, right? No, <laughs> no. But then you go and you look for it. Yeah. Well, he actually found licensed doctors. So he thought he was under proper care. Assuming, assuming. Yes. I, I say assuming because back when he was addicted to, um, was it 
Vicodin or Percocet, I can't remember, for a back problem he had. He, I remember he, he was in an interview and he was recovering from that addiction at the time. And he says, doctors are handing out very strong addictive opioids like they're candy and they need to be cautious. The same thing happened to Brett Favre. He was addicted to Vicodin because of his back issues. Mm -hmm. And he, he kicked the habit, thankfully, because you know, it probably would have killed him. But uh, you have doctors who are handing out serious, powerful narcotics without any regard. Mm -hmm. That's the, and, and the problem with that, the big problem, we don't have that as big a problem in Canada as they do in the U.S. when it comes to doctors handing out that because it's a not-for-profit public infrastructure we have here. Right. The doctor gets paid for whether whether you come in to see him to say, I have a headache, or you come in to say, my back is killing me, the, the doctor gets bills the same for the patient. They don't get any extra for writing the script. Uh, you know, like the, there's no kickback. There's no incentive, financial incentive for them to write your script for Vicodin versus Tylenol 3, for example. There's an, it's the same amount of money. So I find that most doctors in this country are reluctant to hand out serious narcotics on a whim or easily. Most. I'm sure there's some out there that are pill mills. I'm sure they exist, but to a much lesser degree than than, than what we saw in the U.S. when it comes to the OxyContin opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, Dr. David, uh, no, not to, I don't want to say doctor because I don't have that, but David Dadyamov, who's a clinical assistant professor at the USC Mann School of Pharmacy, says, Quote, the drug can be beneficial for treatment of resistant depression, but there are specific doses and measurements that should only be administered in a medical setting. I would never expect a patient to be able to administer that or have the appropriate calculations doing that at home, and particularly if they're using illicitly manufactured ketamine or an illicit supply. Which is why we talk about safe supply. A supply that, in the case of Perry, came from a dealer known as the Ketamine Queen and who police has said is already connected to the death of another ketamine user. With many of the defendants already pleading guilty, the authorities appear to have a strong case. They're hoping uh, they're going public with this because they're hoping that the increased attention will shed light on the dangers of the drug and addiction. Um, because for all the success, and some kids have mentioned this in the chat, um, Perry wanted to help people. And I remember there was a conversation where he was talking about he wanted to help people. And I remember there was another one where he was uh, talking to uh, one of these right-wing people that were saying, like, you could stop anyone. And he's still trying to make the point. He says, no, no, when it comes to alcohol, I have control over whether or not I take the first drink. Right. After I've taken the first one, I have no more control. That's not me. It's like, you need to understand that. It's not just me being lazy or weak or... It's like, once you put... It, the first one in, boom, it sets up a chain of physiological reactions. Your body starts to do things. Your mind starts to do things. Mm -hmm. You are no longer in control. It controls you. Right? That's why it takes so many times for people to get over addiction doesn't work on the first time. Sometimes you got to go back. Mm -hmm. Never quit quitting. If yeah, there's anybody struggling with that right now is watching this, never quit quitting. If you fall off the wagon, you haven't failed. I know. It's statistically, it's normal that you will. Don't You're beat yourself human. up and then quit again. Give yourself the grace to be human and fallible, but then get right back on the wagon. Well, I, I, um, I've gone to my doctor in, in really extreme pain when I tore my shoulder and, uh, he, he just prescribed, uh, some over the counter medication and I'm like, okay, and I tried it and it didn't do anything. And then a, a friend of mine said, well, listen, I have some hydromorphone left from my surgery. Um, he, like there was about a dozen of them. And then he gave me a stool softener because uh, opiates can really yep. 
so I said, he says, take, take half of one now. And if in an hour you're not feeling any better, take the other half. And he says, and then four hours later, take a full pill. So I tried that. Nothing, not, not even a scratch, not even a dent in the pain. So then he said, well, you could take a maximum of two. And I looked at the bottle and said, yeah, so I took two and it did nothing for the pain. It just made me chatty. So I threw them out because they weren't doing anything for me. Yep. The only thing that helped was aspirin, acupuncture, and cupping. And oh, it, cupping, cool. Well, it's and there's no scientific basis in cupping. There's no, there's nothing to to support it. There's no medical evidence that supports it one in, in any way, shape, or form. However, as my doctor said, did it make you feel better? I said yes, and I was willing to try anything at that point. He goes, if it made you feel better, Paul, that's all that mattered. It's all that mattered. And it's, I didn't have to pay extra for that. It was part of the acupuncture therapy. Right. The acupuncture did help. The cupping did help. The aspirin did help. But nothing relieved the pain. And it was at 3 a.m. when the witching hour would hit, when I would be lying in bed and just wake up with, felt like somebody was stabbing me. And it would go on for hours. It was hell. Don't ever tear your shoulder. Do not take your shoulders for granted. If you're doing something and you feel a little pinch or a twinge, stop what you're doing immediately. I cannot stress how important that is because I didn't do that. I tried to power through like a big tough guy and boy, did I pay the price. Hmm. Pain is not weakness exiting the body. Pain is the body's way of telling you to stop what you're doing immediately. Pain is a warning sign. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so there's a quote from him that says, so just to end this on a good note, there are people that will help you get their help. It doesn't go away. It never goes away. Let's talk about addiction. You'll hear that from addicts as well. Even though they haven't touched anything in 35 years, it's like you're an addict forever. So, but there are people that will be willing to help. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in his case, yeah. You know, Maybe his assistant thought that by finding a doctor, you know, there's, I, I don't have details that says that necessarily his personal assistant was looking to get rich off it. Uh, maybe he were, maybe they were, I don't know. But uh, those doctors clearly were. So is the ketamine queen. Um, the other celebrity bit would be um, Taylor Swift. If you, oh, yeah, she was been, unless you've been living around under a rock, you've heard by now that uh, she had three dates in Vienna that had to be canceled uh, because police discovered an ISIS-related plot uh, to uh, launch an attack there, uh, and uh, several teenagers have been arrested in conjunction with that. Um, last night she was in London, England for a series of five concerts. She had been there before earlier on her tour for three, uh, three shows. Mm -hmm. And now she's there for five at Wembley stadium. And there are her first performances since those, uh, concerts were canceled. Um, the tour, the Eras tour is already the highest grossing tour of all time. So that means there's a lot of people there and there's a lot of people, of course, that weren't able to get tickets. Well, the people who weren't able to get tickets often show up at the concert outside Hoping anyway, yeah. like this, and they do something that's called tay gating. <laughs> tay gating, I like that. Yes. So they have a party outside and, you know, they play Taylor Swift music on their boom boxes or car stereos or whatnot, like this, and, you know, or whatever. And they sing and they dance and trade French bracelets. And, you know, it's like, if we can't be inside, we'll be outside. And, hey, Maybe if we're close enough to where everything comes in and out, like this, we might see her leave in her car or something, wave or something, right? The things that we, uh, that a lot of us who were really into music as teenagers would often devote a lot of time to trying to do just to get a glimpse <clears throat> of our favorite star. <clears throat> um, police and security officials uh, were on high alert. But Nick Aldworth, the UK's former counterterrorism coordinator, says that's always the case when it comes to major events. We're speaking about Wembley specifically, he says, quote, it's a very well-practiced complex that hosts some of the highest profile events that we ever hold in this country. And you would expect quite rightly for there to be a gold standard of security wrapped around that 
and there is. Yeah. He says that the nation has learned some countries when it uh, some lessons when it comes to security, because if you remember, uh, there needed to be some fundamental changes after 22 people were killed in a terror attack at an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester in 2017. And then later on in Paris, we had the, the thing at the Bataclan. Um, but the Ariana Grande, and th that did a number on Ariana, Ariana Grande, Grande pretty bad. She was just completely devastated and she could have gone into a deep hole and not emerged from that, that something mm -hmm. happened, but she decided to channel uh, a lot of her um, her own grief into doing things for the community in Manchester specifically to, to try and help. Um, so uh, all to her credit there. Uh, but since then, counterterrorism training has become mandatory for licensed security officials. So, uh, and this is something that we need to take into consideration here in Canada because uh, um, Taylor Swift is heading to Toronto next from London, and then we'll be in Vancouver in December. So uh, that uh, there might be, um, for those who are thinking of maybe doing some take aiding, that might not happen, uh, unfortunately. And it's uh, really sad that because of some dicks, the party has to be ruined for everyone. Yeah. Because seriously, what's more innocent than a teenager showing up at the concert of their favorite star. Mm -hmm. It's about with a whole bunch of other teenagers, but not to sing their songs and dance and have fun, especially since they couldn't get a ticket to get in. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's like you, sh you shouldn't have to die because you decided to get together with a couple of people to sing Taylor Swift songs. Just like you shouldn't have to die for getting an education or going out for milk. Mm hmm right it's just ugh. but yeah that's a uh, when we're talking about this sort of stochastic era it's like it's it's not only politicians right it's it's anybody with a public profile it's anybody with a public profile someone can decide they're going to be a target mm -hmm. they're going to fixate on you and they're going to make you their project or their mission just, and you know uh, celebrities and politicians you know politicians have access to some security ttl celebrities you know uh, the more famous ones you know have money but you know the average person for example like you know the director of a you know let's say uh muslim rights organization they don't necessarily have that budget a drag queen that's going to do drag story time. Mm -hmm. They don't have that budget. It takes the smallest of public profiles. Sometimes set someone off. So, um, you know, it, it's a shame True. that we have to be always like, Hey, you know what? I want to promote literacy and I want to promote tolerance. This, so I'm going to put on my best princess frock and go to the library, make a deal with the library like this and read a children's book to kids stimulate their joy of reading develop their sense of imagination it's like and then have to look over your shoulder the entire time you're on your way there in thunder bay recently at pride thunder bay they had to cancel a dry queen story time i think it's during pride week because in thunder bay because somebody called in a bomb threat. A bomb threat for reading to children. Because you happen to do it in a frock. Yeah. What well, was it I, I saw just, the other day posted? Ridiculous. So at the 2000 Sydney Olympics, they had a drag queen parade. And they rode in on giant shoe floats. Because of the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Exactly. And, and who complained then? Exactly no one. 2024 Paris, everybody loses their effing minds. Settle down. Yeah. Seriously. Um, some economic news that, uh, from the U.S., but that has some uh, bearing on Canada. 
Um, Year-over-year inflation reached its lowest level in more than three years in July, which is the latest sign that the worst price price spike in four decades is fading. And it's setting up the Federal Reserve for an interest rate cut in September. And uh, because we're a little ahead of them, and uh, people are claiming that the last little stock market dip that we had, uh, where the stock market did dip more than 10%, but it's almost already entirely recovered. The TSX is back over 23,000. It's almost at back at record levels. Um, but uh, they're saying that uh, there's a 44% chance that the rate cut in September will be one of half a point rather than just a quarter point. Uh, that meeting from the U.S. Fed is likely to be scheduled around September 17th and 18th. Okay. Um, weekly, uh, the most recent report from the Labor Department in the U.S. showed that the consumer prices rose just uh, 0.2% from June to July. Uh, so that's basically the mildest gain since 2021, and that uh, inflation is down to 2.9% there from 3 Um That, uh, in, core, in conjunction with, um, I think, some manufacturing sales numbers in Canada that were just a little low, and the most recent employment numbers in Canada, where they said uh, basically a loss of 2,000 jobs, but you have to read below the headlines for that one, because we lost 64,000 jobs, but they were part-time jobs, and we gained 62,000 full-time jobs. So even though Mm -hmm. we've lost 2,000 jobs, more people are working more hours. Full-time, so they're actually able to, hopefully, earn enough money to keep a roof over their head. Yeah, and our employment rate uh, stayed steady uh, w- with those ones. But with that, those conditions together, it's looking very likely that, you know, um, they're suggesting that in Canada, I think I mentioned that the other day, that uh, they might cut rates three more times before the end of this year. So at first they were counting just four. They were predicting that there might be four. There will be five. Uh, if things continue, it's quite likely, especially if the United States cuts 50 because uh, then they get uh, they cover more ground, right? Uh, and uh, the gap, uh, which allows Canada, we, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, if the United States cuts, that gives us more leeway to cut more, mm-hmm. because the banks are trying to keep um, the cuts, hopefully within one percent of each other, the distance, so that the dollar isn't too badly affected. Now they've been saying that the dollar Canadian dollar would be very badly affected, and it's sort of like this counterintuitive thing. So, like inflation is going down, which and and inflation employment creation is going down. The economy is cooling, which gives the bank the license to cut interest rates. Where you turn around, you say, "Okay, well, that will like make life more affordable because interest rates are going down." Mm-hmm. But if the spread between the interest rate in Canada and the U.S. gets too large, then the value of the Canadian dollar goes down, which makes right. imports more expensive, which makes what you buy more expense so it's a very delicate balancing act mm. but the dollar which they had expected to drop below 72 cents uh with the cuts so far has remained pretty healthily above 72 and if the united states closes the gap that might actually increase increase our dollar a little bit uh rather than make it uh, go down more if we cut again so uh all this is uh, eventual good news uh, for the United States, it's going to be great news because the first interest rate is coming now within 100 days of the election, and they can say, hey, more to come. Uh, by the time the Canadian election arrives, uh, we might have had a full 2% uh, off what the peak interest rate prime rate was um, in effect, and that uh, might make uh, uh, the current government's economic pros- prospects or economic management uh, approval ratings go up somewhat in time for the election so and it may not Mm -hmm. but it will be one thing under cap and pierre polyev will have a lot less to complain about uh with regard to that of course anybody that's probably renewing their mortgages around this time are going to be paying a little more uh, than they were pre Um, so for them if they lock in for five years at a higher rate uh, even if inflation uh, interest rates starts going down for them their cost is going to remain the same and is going to be higher than it was the last while. So there's only so much political benefit you can get as a political party from interest rates going down, depending on the people who need to lock in their mortgages when. Um, But overall, uh, if those uh, interest rates start going down and the economy starts to activate again, 
because uh, uh, international bodies are suggesting that Canada will probably have the highest economic growth uh, in 2025 of uh, G7 nations and pretty high compared to other OECD nations because right now we're, we're for all intents and purposes, purposes stagnant. We're growing, but you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, right? Which is what the Bank of Canada wanted mm -hmm. when they started raising these interest rates too. So you've got Pierre Polyev saying, you know, we're not growing. No, no, this is what they wanted. They needed to cool down the economy, but hopefully not send it into recession. So as close to 0% growth at this, they can get without going under. Right? And they've managed to achieve that. So uh, this is the system working as it was designed to. But as we keep on mentioning on the show, it takes 18 to 24 months for the effect of interest rate cuts or hikes to start to work its way through the entire economy. So right now, the, we're at the point right now where some of the first cuts, uh, first increases are starting to, to work and uh, take effect. And you can, and like I say, you see it in the job numbers, you see it in the employment numbers, you see it in the, the manufacturing and uh, sales and uh, consumer sales and that type of stuff. Uh, so, but it is working. Now, remember, just because the macroeconomics are good doesn't mean that your personal economics are good. But it well, does mean that the overall ocean in which you are swimming is actually the conditions are set for you to be able to do better. And when the stock market is doing great, it doesn't mean you are. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not everybody that has uh, some retirement funds that are invested. Right? Thank you. Uh, I, thank you, Sean. I, I did screw those up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mixed up white line and great white. Oh, yes. My yes. bad. My bad. Uh, I, my apologies. Yeah. Um, little fighter. And when the children cry or by white line and a great white was once bitten twice shy, which is actually a cover. Great white had a few other songs because the lead singer, Jack Russell, just passed away. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for correcting me, Sean. Appreciate that. All right. I've got, uh, I know we have to go soon, but I got one more story that I'd want to uh, mention. Like it's, oh, Kid Vim. Douglas, you need to teach macroeconomics. Well, Vim is wow. a teacher. So. Thank you. That, wow, that's a great compliment. Um, when I was in my uh, 20s and 30s, I was addicted to Business News Network. <laughs> for some reason, that's when I started investing a little bit for myself to try to say, you know, when I was uh, saving for down payments for home. So I, I would watch a lot of Business News Network, picked up a couple of things along the way. Um, speaking of celebrities, um, mix of sport and celebrity here, but uh, according to Variety magazine, J.K. Rowling and Elon Musk have been named in a criminal complaint filed by French authorities over alleged acts of aggra aggravated cyber harassment against Algerian boxer and newly crowned Olympic gold that. medalist, yeah, Imani Khalif. Hey, go girl. Um, both figures were mentioned in the body of the complaint posted to the anti online hatred center of the Paris prosecutor's office on Friday. The Paris Prosecutor's Office National Center for the Fight Against Online Hatred confirmed it, quote, received the complaint and announced that an investigation had been launched into the courts of cyber harassment because of gender, public incitement to discrimination, and public insult because of origin. Now, Donald Trump will probably be part of the investigation, even though he might not be charged, because Trump tweeted um, something uh, about it as well. Now, um, Khalif was born female mm -hmm. does not identify as transgender or intersex and never has but she still faced a torrent of accusations and abuse over her gender most of the attacks came via social media particularly on twitter and the abuse escalated because it was bad enough when it started but then when celebrities decided not to mind their own freaking business mm -hmm. and stick their nose in it let's associate myself to this thing in order to boost my own engagement mm -hmm. Let's ride the coattails of this thing, jump on that bandwagon, and just proceed to make her life even more miserable. Um, and here, um, just a little content warning in case. Um, but uh, after J.K. Rowling uh, has 14.2 million followers, and she posted a picture of Khalif's fight with Italian boxer Angela Carini, accusing the former of quote, being a man who, quote, it was, who was, quote, enjoying the distress of a woman he's just punched in the head. Yeah, I saw that. So misgendering along the way to create more drama or controversy. 
Uh, Musk shared a post from a Olympic swimmer named Riley Gaines mm-hmm. that quoted, men don't belong in women's sports, and he co-signed it by writing, absolutely. Yes, and then to his millions of followers, Trump posted a message with the picture of the fight accompanied by the message, I will keep men out of women's sports. There was a second boxer as well that was affected by this. She's not getting a lot of mention, but Lin Yuting, who represented Taiwan, Mm-hmm. who also won the gold medal. Yes. By the way. Class. Uh, yes. Uh, I think she was featherweight class. Uh, Khalif, Khalif and Lynn have competed for years in women's events, including in the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. There's no indication they identify as transgender or intersex. Uh, the latter, referring to people born with chromosomes or reproductive organs that don't fit strictly into the male or female gender binary. So all the people that are saying there are only two genders, like this, well, given that we have people that do not fit biologically, into the gender binary. Mm-hmm. It's like you either have to consider them men or women, sort them where they go, or you have to create services and supports and opportunities for sports and whatnot like this for them in their specific categories, then if you're not going right. to include them. But you cannot create a world where you say that there's only two genders and then there are people that don't fit into the binary and say that there's no room for you. That goes against the charter because as a human, you have in any in any that I can never say that word. In 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 in, 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 in inalienable. Animal. Thank you. That's the francophone in me. I can't say that word <laughs> in English. I have trouble. But rights that cannot be breached, rights that are inherent to you by virtue of the fact that you are a human being and that you exist. That's all you need to do to qualify for them. Is exist. Um now, the whole controversy started uh, after a Russian-led international boxing association provided over by a man called Umar Krumlov, who is reportedly an acquaintance of Russian President Vladimir Putin. And they alleged in Russian state media that the two women failed an unspecified gender test, showing that they have male chromosomes. The IOC has come to Khalif and Lin's defense and repeatedly declared them eligible because of the genders listed on their passports. And uh, I also remember that in Algeria, specifically, transgenderism is a crime. That's right. So if Algeria has issued a passport and birth certificates for Imani Khalif that says she is female, she's probably female because I doubt very much there's a large conspiracy in Algeria to unleash male athletes in female sports. Mm -hmm. Okay? Of all the nations... I'm pretty sure Algeria is not one. Definitely that you not. You would go to for that. Um, IOC officials, of course, uh, noted that the, they had severed ties with the International Boxing Association last year because of financial and ethical impropriety. And also, as Mr. Grizzly mentioned on the show, um, no one has ever seen the results of those nope. tests. Quote unquote tests. IOC President Thomas Bach condemned the incendiary online commentary about the two boxers at a news conference on Sunday, chalking it up to hate speech. Quote, we have two boxers who were born as women, who have been raised as women, who have a passport as a woman, and who have competed for many years as women. Uh, Now, Lynn, uh, while uh, Khalif is suing, and she's the second one to sue now, because remember, from the opening ceremony, the lady that was playing the DJ in the tableau based on the painting, the feast of the gods, the Dutch mm-hmm. painting, the feast of the gods that's in a museum in Dijon, France. Mm-hmm. They have good mustard. There. By the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Um, she's suing as well good. because she got a sort of from her sexual orientation, the fact that she's a larger size, plus size woman, all the, all a whole bunch of abuse. So that's two now. Mm-hmm. They're suing Lynn. Uh, Yuting has decided not to sue. So that's a choice that she made for herself. Uh, well, she's but, Taiwanese, so there's, I understand why she wants to keep the spotlight away from her. Yeah. But in Taiwan, she was received as a hero and she has taken on the role of an anti bullying ambassador. Great. That's it. And this person here is not just a boxer, um, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she has a PhD. 
as well. So um, she accepted a sports administration invitation to be the nation's anti-bullying ambassador and would also assume the post of an assistant professor at Chinese Culture University Department's visit of physical education starting in the upcoming semester. Um, as an assistant professor at the university, Lynn would be teaching boxing and sports skill training in the fall semester. Um, and she, oh, and she also, be, she's not a PhD, but she also began pursuing a doctoral degree. She will begin pursuing a doctoral degree in sports next month. Okay. Um, so taking a different path, yes, but still uh, contributing. So I personally hope that they take these celebrities for everything they can. can get. Yeah, no, absolutely. Without question. You know take my them to the cleaners. Take yeah. them to the cleaners. My um take on this is when these things get happen, it's like don't get mad, get everything. <laughs> Remain cool. Get litigious. <laughs> from the first wife's club. Yes. Like th that was Ivana Trump, by the way. Mm coming in at the end of the movie to tell Bette Midler, Goldie Hawn, and uh, Diane Keaton, don't get mad, get everything. <laughs> and I truly do believe in that. Just absolutely go and get it. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, um, oh darn, that's not the original. Oh, okay, I might have to do it. Uh, oh, there it is. Um, Imani Khalif did something really, really interesting. Now, I am hoping that this is something that she just wanted to do to tell people, you know what? Here. Basically a flipping of the bird. Um, oh, yeah, part yeah, of me yeah. saying that maybe she felt she had to do this given the controversy, but you know what, girl? Mm, mm, mm. Take yeah, a well. look at Imani Khalif outside of the boxing ring. Okay, baby. Yeah, good on Okay, that. baby. Walk, yeah. walk, fashion, baby. Mm. All right, we got to wrap up Keep today, sir. Punching, I gotta girl. Get, I got to get Keep rolling punching, here. I gotta, girl. I've got appointments I got to get to uh, today. Uh, right. I just wanted to give you this quick one thing here, which somebody pointed out uh, at Michael Healy, at Healy, uh, no, Michael Healy, at Healy Types, T Y P E S, on the Twitter. Uh, Diane Reed uh, reposted this, and this is a good one because pay attention, folks. CPC calling the Sudbury Holiday and Swanky should give you pause about the level of austerity they'll impose when in power. Ooh. Right? They're Ooh. calling that lavish and swanky? If the Holiday Inn in Sudbury is too lavish for the Prime Minister of a G7 Nation, what's good enough for you? What a great observation. No kidding, right? Like, wow, is... thank you for finding that. Yeah. Yeah, again, little juxtaposition provides a lot of perspective sometimes. Well, and give you more perspective on why things are the way they are. It's not a whole lot different in Canada, but this is Robert Reich pointing this out in the United States of America. Just four companies in the U.S. control 85% of beef, beef processing, 80% of corn seed distribution, 77% of fertilizer production, and 69% of grocery sales. Wondering why gro food prices are so high? Minimal competition means maximized price gouging. And that's not a whole lot different from the situation we have here in Canada. You think you have choice, but you don't. People go, well, I was in, I was in Cuba and all I saw was three different brands. Yeah, there's about four brands that control like 95% of the products that are on the market right now. You think you have choice, but the, all the money's going to the same pocket. Anyway, we got to wrap her up. I got to get going. All right, Kiss and Cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you loved listening to us because we loved making this for you. Now, remember that sharing is caring and world, uh, word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Um, get some cubs as we're ending the show. A certain uh, person that's insisting on being such a Chad is back again. 
same rules. Please don't engage. All right. Um, let, the, let the brain donkeys cry themselves out. Um, <laughs> hey, but, let your freak flag fly. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> to, yeah, no, no, just, just to roll on, roll on, roll on. Let's wrap I'm up. I'm bothered. Yeah. Um, remember, uh, so sharing is caring. Tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to not miss an episode, hey, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray girl. She's fly. She's fabulous, particularly on Fridays. And she sponsors our pod page. So if you scan the QR code that Mr. Grizzly will make appear under my chin or use those lovely digits on your lovely fingers or your voice prompt command to go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. When we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you if you subscribe. If you would like to support us in other ways, then you need to surf your way on down to our YouTube page where Kit Elaine is always there to welcome you. Have a beyond awesome weekend, everyone. And remember to smash the button before you leave. And we've got three of them for you. Like, share, and subscribe. So smash them. We get ourselves some happy. You do a, your good deed for the day. Everybody wins. If you'd like to help us in other ways, uh, then the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to the True North Eager Beaver coffee page where you will find our tip jar. And it has arrived, kits and cups. It has arrived. Isn't I don't need the money to pay it's for so it. Tiny. Isn't it so cute? I like it. Yeah. So He's portable. got a Mac Mini, same, same yeah. machine I have, so we'll get him set up over the course of the next few days. So hopefully when it is set up, the era of the show will start at 7-something. Tech willing will be over. <laughs> yes. Should be. Absolutely but should be. If you would like to help us with that, we really appreciate that. So scan that QR code or coffee, ko fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And uh, there you can help us. Now, if you can't contribute financially, that's quite all right. We're okay with that. We're okay with that because the gift of your attention is the one that is the most important to us. And we love to hear from you. So if you're not here to participate in the chat with the best damn fam and all of podcasting, you can still be a member by sending us an email, for example, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com and let us know what you think or leave a com comment on our YouTube page, on our Twitter feed at True Eager or our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver. We read everything, not always able to respond, but we do read absolutely everything and we thank you uh, for your participation in making our show better, particularly when you send us story ideas. Yes, Love we appreciate much. that. All right. It, because democracy is something that you do. Remember, by elections coming up, Ward 15, Toronto, uh, La Salle, Villemar, Verdun, and Edmonton, uh, not Edmonton, Elmwood, Transcona. I think those are coming up in about two weeks or so. So, um, uh, and of course, provincial elections coming up in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. So, again, find research your candidates, find your candidate of choice. You know, if you're really invested, please do some stuff like uh, phone banking and uh, uh, knocking on doors or volunteer in any way uh, or volunteer at your polling station as well. Let them know that you might be interested so that the election can run smoothly. Very important. We uh, thank you for all of that. Um, also, if you uh, have not yet, um, the episode of The O Show that I recorded with uh, the wonderful Laura Babcock is now out. I will hopefully be able to put it a uh, link to it in the chat for you uh, before we uh, finish the show. Uh, please take some time to listen to it if you can. It's very, very important to me specifically because we're talking about kids and care, and that's very, very dear to my heart. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I appreciate uh, any attention that you can give that and sharing that and uh, and all that good stuff. Oh, did you share it, Mr. Wesley? Yeah, it's done. It's there. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Fast action. No um, all right. So for go. me, that's it. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? None today. I got to go. Like, I'm, I'm late. I'm, I'm really late. I gotta okay. Go. Then, kids, be kind to and gentle with yourself. There'll be no Easter egg. Have a be horrific weekend. See ya. Bye. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, 
your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music.